So I assume oh, Charlie's okay. Charlie's up there. Cool. Set. Uh, let me get on here right now. I'll see. Uh, I think I am. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. I'm on. Can you hear me? Thank you. All right, I am ready. Let's get started with the March 21st uh, meeting of the City Council. Ms. Master? Do we need to start recording? And we're live streaming. of Information Act, Section 2.2-3708.2, and state and local legislation adopted to allow for continued government operations during the COVID-19 declared emergency. All participating members of City Council and other boards will be present at this meeting through electronic means, and members of the public can view this meeting at www dot falls church va dot gov slash council meetings and on fcc tv channels cox 11 rcn 2 and verizon 35. city council work sessions are conducted to allow council members to discuss upcoming legislation and policy issues the public is not generally invited to speak public comment may be sent to city clerk at falls church va dot gov 
All comments are provided in full to the members of council and will be summarized at the next regular meeting. And for roll call, if I may have a confirmation for the following council members. Ms. Connolly? Here. Mr. Duncan? Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Ms. Leon? Here. Ms. Shansiska? Here. Mr. Snyder? Here. And Mayor Tarter? Here. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and again, again welcome, welcome to the to Monday, Monday, March 21st work session of the Falls Church City Council. I'm pleased you all are able to join us this evening. Um, we do have uh, several items on the agenda and also including a closed session afterwards. So I just want you all to keep that in mind as well. Uh, before we go to our first item, I just want to congratulate uh, those who organized the um, Women's History uh, March reception. Uh, particularly Mary Beth Conley for a really extraordinary afternoon honoring some extraordinary people. So uh, I think our hats off to you. Almost everybody, if not everyone at council, was able to attend. So a very uh, well done afternoon. So thank you so much. Um, let's go Thanks, on. Thanks, Carter. Thanks sure. everyone for being there. Really highlighted some wonderful people, and we'll be able to celebrate them further on May first at the Women's History Walk. Thanks. Well, we all look forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's go on and get started, unless there's any other preliminary matters with the um, work session, particularly the East End area plan. Mr. Shields, is there any um, any introductory remarks you'd like to make? Uh, just very briefly. Thank you, Mayor Tarter, members of council. Um, this matter is before you tonight just for an update and for council discussion and direction on some of the main uh, strategic objectives that have been identified so far in the small area planning process for the East End area plan. Um, ultimately, if you look on at the towards the end of the report, there is the schedule there. We're, we'll be working on this through the summer and the fall and coming back to the City Council to request action on this in November of 2022. So we're this is one step in the process, sort of a check in. Emily Baysmore is our uh, lead staffer on this. And before I turn it over to her, let me just ask Paul Stoddard, our planning director, who's also on the call. Paul, if you wanted to make any other introductory uh, remarks, or should we turn it uh, directly over to Ms. Bazemore? Sure. Thank you, Wyatt. I'll just say one thing, uh, Council, we are. Uh, what you're going to see is a partial draft. Uh, we've got several chapters to share with you tonight, which we're obviously excited about. One, sharing with you our work to date, uh, but also getting your feedback that as part of building this plan, uh, our intent is to check in with you along the way uh, to make sure we're going in the direction that, that you think is right for this area. So what, uh, like I said, you're going to see a partial draft here, uh, which I think is already pretty compelling in its, in its current form. Uh, and obviously, we've got more work to do is why it laid out in the draft schedule. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to uh, Senior Planner Emily Basemore. Thank you, Paul. Um, good evening, Council. Uh, City Council is requested to review and provide feedback on the draft introduction and background concepts and land use and zoning chapters of the East End Small Area Plan tonight. In particular, staff is requesting that the City Council provide input on the following. Um, number one, are the draft vision statement and goals compelling and responsive to community needs? Number two, do the proposed concepts accurately reflect the city's priorities for the East End? Number three, are there additional elements that should be considered in the concepts chapter? Number four, are there additional land use strategies that should be explored in the land use and zoning chapter? And finally, number five, a review of our proposed timeline for the small area planning effort. Um, staff recommends that the City Council review the three chapters and address the questions raised above. Um, the draft introduction and background chapter, as well as the concepts chapter of the East End Small Area Plan, were both presented to the Planning Commission back on December 1st of 2021. Um, a table summarizing the Planning Commission's comments begins on line 64 of the staff report. Since the December Planning Commission meeting, staff has updated the chapters reviewed by the Planning Commission and drafted the land use and zoning chapter for review. Um, just to touch briefly on background, um, the city's comprehensive plan identifies several planning opportunity areas within the city. Uh, generally, the POA follows the Washington Street and Broad Street area. 
um, encompassing commercial areas of the city. Uh, the comprehensive plan describes POAs as being areas where property is currently underutilized. Uh, redevelopment of the PDO POAs could help improve quality of life in the city and further the realization of the comprehensive plan's overall vision for the city. Um, so far, we've completed um, multiple um, small area plans and the East End actually happens to be the final small area plan for the various POAs. Um, right there is our plan for planning map and I'll show that again later in a presentation. Um, I want to skip down to line uh, 46, uh, planning process to date. So far, staff has hosted a stakeholders meeting way back in September, um, specifically September 15th, 2021. Um, we had representatives from Eden Center, the Coalition for Smart Growth, Arlington County and Fairfax in attendance. Um, we also hosted a community kickoff meeting um, on November 6, 2021. That was held in Stephenson Hall at Columbia Baptist Church. Um, public turnout was substantial, it was very impressive with around 50 community members in attendance along with members of city council. Um, an additional community meeting is slated for, that should be September uh, 2022, um, but staff is also considering community pop-ups within the Eden Center to organically engage with the public and provide information on our small area planning process, as well as answer um, any questions or concerns from our community. Um, again, there is a a whole chart of um, different feedback from the Planning Commission starting on line 64. Um, much of their feedback uh, had an emphasis on business preservation within the Eden Center. Um, so instead of hopping over to staff analysis, I would like to go ahead and go into the presentation, Cindy. Thank you. All right, yes, so the East End Small Area Plan. Um, next slide. All right. All right. Yes, that one right there. Uh, so what is small area planning? Um, small area planning is a form of long range planning um, for a specific area to address unique issues um, within that area with tailored solutions for the area. Um, small area plans provide recommendations for public and private investments over the span of five to 10 to 20 plus years. Um, they also provide area specific framework for redevelopment within the guidelines of the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, next slide. Again, our very nice plan for planning map. Um, so our plan for planning map highlights the various planning opportunity areas within the city. Um, since 2011, the city has worked to develop small area plans for each of the POAs. Um, the development of these plans have been a collaborative effort between our city staff, city council, boards and commissions, and of course the community at large. Uh, the city has adopted again five area, or five small area plans, um, starting with North Washington in 2012, South Washington in 2013, the Downtown Small Area Plan in 2014, uh, the West Broad Street Plan in 2016, and most recently, the West End Plan in 2020. Um, again, East End Small Area Plan is very excitingly um, our last small area plan for the various POAs. Next slide. All right. Um, and this is just an aerial of the area um, of the POA. So you can see some of our key areas such as Eden Center along Wilson. Um, you see Roosevelt Boulevard as well. To the right of Roosevelt, there's the BJ site. Um, and then if you swing over to East Broad or Route 7, you can see 24-hour fitness on one side and then Coons on the other side. Next slide. All right. So our introduction and background chapter. Um, so this was our first drafted chapter of the East End Small Area Plan. Um, it starts off with the purpose of the plan, which again is to provide a framework for reinvestment in the East End that ultimately supports and builds upon the guidelines established in our comp plan. Um, from the purpose, it moves to the authority of the plan. A few things to note about the authority of the plan. The plan is conceptual. The recommendations are meant to be a starting point for public and private investments and POA 5. Um, the plan does not constitute a change to the city's comprehensive plan, future land use map, zoning ordinance, or zoning map. Um, next, the chapter provides geographical and regional context by explaining the location of POA 5. 
Um, the East End is the city's portion of Seven Corners containing major roadways such as Route 7 or East Broad Street, um, Wilson Boulevard, Roosevelt Boulevard, which provides access to the East Falls Church Metro. Um, and the East End of Falls Church also shares a boundary with Arlington County and Fairfax County. Um, plan methodology is also captured in this chapter. Next slide. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, so following methodology is our history portion. The history portion is robust, so I'm just going to go after some um, key points in our history portion of this chapter. Um, so starting off, we have the American history section or American Indian section. Um, this section talks about uh, the Dogs who resided on uh, the Mason Neck along the Potomac River. Um, historians believe that what we now know as Route 7 was once an American Indian travel route, which the English colonists eventually made into a major east-west road. Um, from the American Indian history, we go to the colonial era. Um, this, we explore the, the history of the Vestal's Gap Road, as well as the first um, Methodist meeting house, which was the Fairfax Chapel. Um, the meeting house is located where a modern-day Oakwood Cemetery is now. Um, moving from the colonial era to the Civil War, um, details of the New York infantry, infantry um, where they established Fort Buffalo is explored. Um, this is along the south side of Leesburg Pike. Uh, at its intersection with Sleepy Hollow Road. Um, Fort Buffalo had great views from the south and east to scope out the Confederate troops. Um, west of Fort Buffalo was Taylor's Tavern, an important outpost for Union troops. Um, today, Taylor's Tavern is actually the site of um, Fort Taylor Park. Um, and then from the Civil War, we dip into African American history. So the story of African American history, specifically that of Freddie Foot Sr., who purchased 28 acres of land while enslaved from the man who enslaved him, um, is noted in the chapter. In the coming years, uh, Foot went on to purchase 13 more acres of land before his death. Um, the Foot properties are now on the sites of or the location of Eden Center. Coons and the Seven Corners Shopping Center. Um, finally, the history of the East End post World War II is captured in this chapter. Um, in the early 1950s, Lee Memorial Boulevard was constructed, and its crossing with Leesburg Pike created a seven corner intersection, which is now known as Seven Corners. Um, within the next few decades, thanks to this intersection and all the traveling that's going on there, um, this area becomes the shopping mecca that it is now. Uh, next slide. All right, moving from history to reinvestments. So some key reinvestments in the area um, or in the East End are noted within this chapter. Um, Eden Center saw the construction of the Good Fortune Grocer down on the bottom left-hand corner in 2014. Um, Coons demolished a one-story building to allow for surface level parking. These renovations took place in 2015. Um, Falls Green Apartments, formerly known as Oakwood Apartments, uh, they were constructed way back in 1974, saw renovations in 2019, and you can see very nice um, apartment building down on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and finally, the sim store that was located along Route 7 was converted into 24-hour fitness with those renovations happening back in 2019. Um, something key to note about these reinvestments is that here we're seeing reinvestments in buildings, but not redevelopment. All right, next slide. Moving from reinvestments to recent planning strategies. So within this chapter, we also see planning guidance and past studies explored. Um, let me know if you guys can hear me. There's a little bit of background noise. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So moving into planning guidance and past studies. Um, so two recent planning studies of interest that were recently done for the area are the Virginia Tech student study from back in 2019. Um, this study envisioned more than um, three or yes, that's three million square foot of mixed use in the area um, and increased density by a factor of four improved pedestrian bicycle um, network, a multimodal transport center, a denser um, Eden Center with public space, and a denser residential use along Roosevelt Avenue. 
Also, the ULI TAP from 2018 um, identifies Eden Center as the focal point, um, which you'll see in our plan, um, established a grid of streets, annexed uh, three Fairfax County parcels, envisioned Oakwood Cemetery as open space for the public, um, an increase in overall density for the area, and the conversion of Eden Center to mixed use. And this is something that would be done in the long term. Um, next slide, please, Cindy. Thank you. All right, the concepts chapter. All right, so the concepts chapter leads with uh, the following draft vision statement. So next slide. All right, um, I'm just going to read it directly from the slide. So the East End is a cultural hub focused on the Eden Center. Transportation investments put people first by prioritizing connectivity and accessibility. Green spaces provide opportunities for community members to gather, recreate, and relax. Nearby housing affordability is preserved while new commercial and residential development occurs within the planning opportunity area. Um, next slide, please. To achieve the vision, staff has drafted the following goals for investment in the area. Goal one, strengthen the Eden Center and its cultural identity, celebrate Vietnamese American culture through programming and public art investments in Eden Center. Goal two, enhance multimodal mobility and accessibility throughout the East End. Goal three, activate public spaces to create community connections, strengthen the sense of community on the East End by providing space for the public to enjoy and gather, um, incorporate green space for connection to nature. Goal four, preserve and provide housing opportunities in and around the East End. As the planning opportunity area develops, preserve the quality and affordability of existing nearby housing, provide design transitions between existing housing and new development, create housing that is affordable to a variety of household sizes and range of incomes. And then finally, our goal five, um, support economic revitalization throughout the East End, invest in the East End to create and maintain consistent economic activity and return the area to its regional prominence. All right, next slide. All right, and just to preface all of this, the concepts within this chapter ultimately support the plan's vision and goals. So concept one, uh, strengthen the Eden Center and its cultural identity. So this concept um, in, in the draft text begins with the history of Eden Center and its relation to um, Arlington or Clarendon and Arlington and um, how these businesses originally were located there and then came into the city. Um, from history, it moves into recommendations recommendations, um, starting with creating a space for celebration of culture, um, such as a permanent plaza. Um, Eden Center could use this space for programming around the Moon Festival or the Mid-Autumn Festival, its movie nights, or other um, events. Um, we also want to um, pay homage to Vietnam through public art. Um, murals, sculpture, and other forms of visual art should be incorporated into the Eden Center, um, transporting visitors into a creative experience and honoring Vietnam. Um, here on the right side, we have a nice mural from, I believe, San Diego um, of Little Saigon. Um, and then, of course, uh, this particular concept ends with renaming Wilson Boulevard to Saigon Boulevard to create a gateway to the Eden Center area and communicate a sense of identity upon entering the city of Falls Church. Uh, next slide, please. All right, concept two, enhance multimodal mobility and accessibility. So this concept uh, begins with the, um, well, explaining the connectivity between the East End, Fairfax, Arlington, and Alexandria um, as it sits in a multimodal transportation hub. Um, this concept advocates for better pedestrian and cycling experience with wider sidewalks, safe and frequent crossings, um, buildings that are oriented towards the streets um, and designated bike lanes like you can see on the right hand side. Um, it notes that there's um, a need for an internal street grid uh, that would break up the large blocks that currently exist in the East End um, and also provide safe and frequent crossings and enhance connectivity among adjacent sites. Um, it suggests that Wilson Boulevard be celebrated as a great street and it emphasizes that coordination should continue between Falls Church and Fairfax regarding the Ring Road. Um, next slide, please. All right, concept three. 
Um, concept three is activating public spaces for community connections. So here we envision Eden Center as a public gathering space. Again, going back to that, that concept to have a plaza, a permanent public plaza, and Eden Center ties into this as well. Um, we want to include spaces for children to play, public and private parks designated or designed for children would benefit adjacent multifamily residential complexes, as well as um, new residential development in the area and visitors in the area. Um, this is something that we actually took from the community meeting. It was something that a lot of people noted it would be nice to have a spot for kids to play. Um, the nearest playgrounds are actually in Arlington and then um, Fairfax. I can't remember off the top of my head the names of them, though. Um, also, uh, we want to incorporate pocket parks and green spaces to soften the existing um, urban landscape in the East End. Um, and we've, we've mentioned establishing uh, East End Farmers Market. So the one located at City Hall, of course, has seen great success for a long time. Um, and we think maybe a similar type of market on the East End could serve to make the area an even larger regional attraction. Um, next slide, please. All right. So concept four is housing. Um, so something interesting to note about the East End is that it currently consists of entirely commercial use. So to keep up with regional housing demand and provide housing throughout the whole of the city, um, housing opportunities should be provided in the East End POA. Um, particularly senior housing is something we're looking at. Um, many patrons and business owners in the East End or um, in the Eden Center are part of an aging population and they often travel from neighboring areas. So senior housing would allow this population to age in place and remain in the community where they have played such an integral role. Um, also, family-sized housing. Um, we believe family-sized housing should be built to accommodate a range of housing needs. Um, Two-bedroom and three-bedroom rental units are under, um, underserved in the city presently. Also, condominiums. Um, we believe that condominiums would allow for the opportunity of expanded home ownership in the city. Um, and also, this type of housing attracts a diverse group of people in regards to age, income, and household size. And finally, the preservation of existing housing. Um, as the East End develops, uh, the existing neighboring housing should be preserved. Much of this housing stock is accessible to a variety of incomes and family sizes. So this is lending to inclusivity and diversity in the city. Um, next slide, please. All right, and our final concept is concept five, the Eastern Gateway's economic revitalization. Um, so to to continue to invest in the East End um, and to do that, you want to consider what is currently working for the area um, and continuing to improve existing properties um, and those businesses. So we want to encourage ongoing private investments in Eden Center. Um, these investments could be facade renovations, interior renovations, um, the expansion of sidewalks, the addition of private murals and art. Um, we want to include infill development to support revitalization efforts. Um, early infill development could occur on existing service level parking lots, um, but larger long-term redevelopment could replace large commercial buildings to help bring activity to the street edge. Also investments in the public realm. Um, so the East End is four or one of four identified gateways in the city. Um, a sense of arrival could be accomplished through a unified streetscape design, signage, um, eye-catching monuments, art or architecture. Um, on the bottom left-hand side of the corner, uh, we have a really cool gateway feature that could possibly be replicated in the East End. Uh, next slide, please. All right, our land use and zoning chapter. So this is actually our most recently completed draft chapter. Um, the chapter opens with the existing land uses throughout the East End. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Cindy. All right, um, so as you can tell from this map, the most common use is shopping center. Um, it totals at 15.9 acres, uh, while light industrial automotive use is the runner up at 15.2 acres. So the shopping center is found in the hot pink color and then um, the silver is where you can see the light industrial automotive use. Next slide, please. All right, 
Um, and then following our existing land use, we have our existing zoning. Um, so again, light industrial dominates the East End with businesses such as Eden Center, BJ's, and public storage all falling within the zoning category. Um, and then we also have uh, the general business district or the B3 zoning district um, with Coons and then 24-hour fitness both falling into this category. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, could you go back? Sorry about that. All right, um, included in the chapter, not included in the presentation, but included in the chapter, um, we've, we have went ahead and noted uh, the adjacent zoning districts uh, because those um, you can see where we have some residential nearby. So Falls Green and the Madison are both part of the nearby multifamily residential zoning district. And then um, there are also multiple uh, single family homes that are part of the medium density residential zoning district. All right, next slide now. Thank you. All right, so this is our existing density. Um, as you can see, the majority of the parcels within the east end have an FAR of 0.1 to 0.3. The east end is identified as an adopted revitalization district, which calls for densities of 3.0 FAR or higher. So we definitely have some work to do here. Um, if you could go to the next slide. All right, and this one captures our existing impervious coverage, which is at a whopping 78%. Um, with redevelopment activity, there is the opportunity to reduce this coverage um, with the introduction of green infrastructure. Uh, this could be rain gardens. Uh, this could be green roofs. All right, and if you could go to the next slide. All right, this is our beautiful proposed uh, land use chart. So this, this flows into um, the next couple of slides, which are um, nodes. And um, we've coined this term nodes as targeted areas for reinvestment efforts. They're all captured on this particular map. Um, the nodes are land areas of interest within the POA um, for future land use and zoning activities to revitalize the East End. So some of what we have going on here is the addition of mixed use, for instance, um, on the 24-hour fitness and coon site. You can see restaurant and retail and residential is on the 24-hour fitness site. Um, so that's kind of um, a alluding to that mixed use that we envisioning going there. Um, we also want to bring in more green space. So we want to do that throughout the POA, but particularly you can see on um, the Eden Center site, there is a big green square. That's, um, that's noting addition of green space. Also over on the BJ site, there's more green space included. And then if you look along Wilson Boulevard and Roosevelt Boulevard um, on the Eden Center site, as well as um, neighboring the BJ site by public storage as well, we have some um, infill that's noted. Next slide, please. All right, so this is our first node, um, and node zero actually encompasses the area as a whole. So um, a goal of the East End Small Area Plan is to create greener, walkable streets, introducing plazas and parks for quality public spaces. Uh, node zero or comprises um, all areas throughout the East End with the intention of creating walkable streets, designating spaces for plazas and public areas, incorporating green roofs, allocating spaces for children to play, and rethinking the existing Oakwood Cemetery as an opportunity for green space. Next slide, please. All right, uh, node one is uh, the 24-hour fitness site and Coons redevelopment site. Um, here we have this idea for a town center-like development. Um, this redevelopment would play into uh, the nearby Ring Road redevelopment. Um, we see it as something that would benefit both um, Fairfax County and the city. Um, so the 24-hour fitness and Coons site occupy node one, totaling approximately 10 acres of land. Um, redevelopment of this site in conjunction with either or of the 24-hour fitness site in conjunction with either the Coons Board site or adjacent properties in Fairfax County hold the opportunity to create a town center-like development in the East End. Um, the town center would act as a welcoming feature into this area of the city with walkable streets, active street-facing retail that invites visitors to spend time shopping, dining, and lingering in the area. Um, this opportunity uh, for reinvestment is significant because it also holds the opportunity to bring in residential, as you can see in the, um, the top right-hand corner. Um, or even office use into this area. Next slide, please. 
All right, note two is the Eden Center. Um, the Eden Center, a cultural anchor for the Vietnamese American community, occupies note two. The vision for this area is to preserve core existing structures while enhancing the surrounding environment. Um, the opportunity to construct structured parking should be explored in the Eden Center, as well as the creation of permanent ground level spaces for event programming. Um, infill and active edges should be incorporated to further activate retail in the area, as well as incorporate potential uses such as hotel and that senior housing that we had mentioned earlier. Um, next slide, please. All right. Node three is east of Roosevelt. So we're talking about BJ's public storage, that area. Um, so the land area east of Roosevelt Boulevard comprises Node 3. Within this area of the East End, there is an opportunity to consolidate properties um, and limited redevelopment of the BJ's parking lot would allow for new redevelopment along Wilson that could complement the potential mixed use in nearby Node 1. Um, given the existing character of the area as one that is ideal um, that, ca that caters towards um, dining and food, staff envisions maybe a food hall in this area. Um, and you can see that potential use up in the right-hand corner. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, and at the end of the land use and zoning chapter, we've included a couple of strategies. I'm just gonna read them right off the slide. So strategy number one is to work with Fairfax County to adjust the boundary line between Falls Church and Fairfax County to incorporate the small parcel north of the Seven Corners intersection into the city. This would allow for a better coordinated land use planning efforts for the small area between Fairfax and Falls Church post boundary line adjustment. Um, number two, encourage sites that can be planned at five or more acres to achieve 15% tree canopy coverage. Number three, amend the zoning code to allow for the special exception process, the SE process to be accessed through M1 light industry district, um, allowing for more flexibility in our redevelopment efforts. Um, note, this would not replace the mixed use redevelopment zoning allowance that exists currently, or this could replace, I'm sorry, um, the MUR that exists currently within this area. Um, and number four, um, if an appropriate redevelopment application is submitted for the 24-hour fitness site, uh, we want to consider rezoning that small portion of land at the front of the site, um, fronting Roosevelt from T1 transitional over to B1 business. All right, next slide, please. All right, these are our next steps. But before I get into next steps, um, something cool that we've done in the land use and zoning chapter is we've included a glossary of terms just because um, land use terms can be um, very specific and we want to make sure that everyone has a good understanding um, when they're reading the chapter. If they have any questions, they can always flip to the back um, of the chapter to kind of get a better understanding of what the, the definition of zoning is versus land use versus density and whatnot. Um, so going into our next steps now, um, we have a planning commission work session. This is their second time seeing the small area plan tentatively scheduled for April of 2022. Um, we have us coming back to you guys with all of our chapters in May or June of 2022. Um, and then we have boards and commissions going from July to September of 2022 with a community meeting again in September of 2022. Um, planning Commission work session again October, followed by another City Council work session in October with both Council Action and Planning Commission Action in November 2022. And if you could go to the next slide. This is just a little update on where we're at in the drafting process. So it's very exciting. We actually have five chapters drafted. Um, three we consider complete and then two are pending internal review. Our last chapters to get drafted are urban design. That one's coming up. And then our last is infrastructure and environment. And that's all for me. Um, I'm looking forward to your feedback and your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that very informative presentation. Let's go ahead and open it up to council questions and comments. Any council questions or comments? If you could raise your hand, and I'm happy to recognize you, uh, Ms. Connolly, then Ms. Leon, and then Ms. Hardy. Thanks, Emily. Um, it's, it's really nice to see that you are looking really closely at what's there and how we can keep what's good and make it better. So thank you for that. Um, I really, as, as the wayfinding signs have gone up, 
around the city. I'm so thrilled that Eden Center is on those signs. I think that's really important to identify that that's in the city. So I know that's not part of this plan, but it's a really good first step there. Um, I have a lot of, I went through the whole thing as I like to do with these plans. So I have some things that I'll just send to you. They're typos and things, but one question is you call it, there's no mention of the Fairfax water tower anywhere in here, which is a thing that's there. Um, in the other, my other question is just about your outreach. Can you do some pop-ups at those three residential areas that are next door? I know they're not in the planning area, but the Roosevelt, the Madison and Oakwood and Madison, I think is a condo building. So as you do pop-ups at Eden Center, could you also do pop-ups for those residents? Yeah, that's something that we had not considered, but that's actually a really great idea. They were very much present at the community meeting. So I, I remember, would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we have been in contact with the Madison. Um, they've invited us to speak sometime in the spring to them and present some of our plans. Okay. And then there were also the, the other neighbors that live nearby. Maybe they were Arlington neighbors that were there who were a little concerned. So maybe if they got pulled into the to something at one of those uh, residential areas, that would be good. Um, you, you keep saying American Indian. I'm wondering if you can switch that to Native American. Okay. Yeah, so we had Native American at first and we switched it to American Indian, but we can definitely go back and make that edit. I think that's, I think that's a, a, the, the current usage. Um, you, in the title, you're calling it Seven Corners and using the number seven. Can you write out the word seven? Um, and then you say root seven, which I think is appropriate to have a seven. But I'm wondering if you want to call that also known as Broad Street and Leesburg Pike. Because it's Broad Street and Falls Church and Le Leesburg Pike across the street. So if somewhere you can reference that it's all those things. But for us, it should be Broad Street. Uh, and on page 2-3, there's an idea that we should rename Wilson Boulevard Saigon Boulevard. Where did that come from? Yeah, so that was something I believe, I can't remember exactly who on the planning team pitched that, but that was a staff idea. Um, that did not come from the stakeholders meeting or the community meeting, but we thought it would be a nice way um, to indicate that you're entering the city of Falls Church, but specifically you're entering the Eden Center area. I would ask you to reconsider that. Um, Maybe an internal road within Eden Center could be called Saigon Boulevard. That just, it, it, when I read that, it, it didn't, I, I wasn't, I don't know. Maybe I need to learn more about it. But the city itself is no longer called Saigon. And uh, I, I don't know. It just seems like maybe if they're going to redevelop inside, Saigon Boulevard could be an internal area within Eden Center. Okay. And council member, if I could uh, just yeah. to chime in, that was uh, previously part of actually a city legislative agenda. Uh, and so when we had uncovered that in the records, we thought it would be interesting to, to float that idea another time. But I think you're right that it, it certainly bears some, some consideration. Yeah. And then throughout in the history part, um, you mentioned the Vietnamese War or the Vietnam War or can, can you just um, and then it's. It's really a center of Asian culture at this point because there are so many other cultures represented there. So I wonder if we want to call it a center of Asian culture rather than just Vietnamese culture. But the Vietnam War wasn't actually a war. It was a conf right, officially a conflict. So since this is an official document, it should probably have the official term on it. Um, and I love that you are using the BJ's parking lot better. I I'm assuming the reason they have so much parking is because they were required to do so. But to turn that into green space is just a great idea. Um, and then my what last question is just about Fort Taylor Park. I was looking at some of the comments that uh, people made during the community engagement. And there were a couple comments that Fort Taylor Park itself 
needs to be fixed up now that it, I have, I have not been there in a long time, but that it's not in really good shape. So I'm wondering that isn't a planning commission or a planning department issue, but maybe we need to take a look at Fort Taylor park sooner rather than later. Um, and then the yeah, other yeah. little, thank you for that comment. I'll, I'll follow up with a uh, record park staff on that. And um, okay. there's an immediate action. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes those kind of things, you get those like big long-term strategic things and then the little immediate action. So, and then, um, Emily, there's just a few other little typos and apostrophes and things like that. I'll just email those to you because people don't need to listen to me say that. But thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And I think it's, um, I can't believe we're at the last one. I remember talking to Jim Snyder when we started the first one. And he said, oh, it'll take 11 or 12 years. And I couldn't even have imagined how far 11 or 12 years was in the future. But here we are. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Miss Leon. And I'm very thankful that I'm here to catch the last one. <laughs> yeah, Councilwoman Conley. So uh, my comments are really centered around the attachment that is titled Land Use and Zoning. Um, Emily, uh, wonderful work on this. And I, I think um, the nature of my questions are around these four strategies. Uh, the first one is... Um, a, a request. Is there any way that you can? Oh, uh, I think um, if you're trying to pull it up, Cindy, it is further down. It's more towards the end. Keep. Oh, so oh, yeah, page timers are taking on. Um, sorry, where is that page number? It's the second to last page, 14. It doesn't have one, okay. Or I don't see one here. Uh, there you go. So is there any way that you can pull up a map to designate um, visually what the small parcel is that you're referring to? I just wanna make sure I'm not assuming I understand that. Yeah, yeah, for number four? Uh, for number one. Oh, for number one, okay. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of which map may be the best. Um, Sydney, can you go to the aerial view? All right. And could you zoom in to, it's going to be right by the intersection. Getting a little bit of feedback. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my end, like audio. You're clear no, to no, no. us. Okay, okay, good. good. All right, so if you go down a little bit and zoom in um, closer to the seven corners intersection. All right, so... It's there's a dentist office that exists there right now, um, and it's it's the very like very bottom. There's a point where um, closest to the Seven Corners intersection, um, and currently that is zoned as part of the county, but everything around it is part of the city. So that's what that particular strategy is referencing. Yes, that, so that that area. pocket that is the frontage along Wilson Boulevard as you curve left to Wilson Boulevard on that diagram. Yes, ma'am. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, and the blow up helped. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, my second question is really on strategy number two. Considering we're at Founders Road 2 and we've got a two and a half acre development that has 15% tree canopy coverage, if I remember this correctly, just wanna make sure we're, we're, we're setting our sites on that strategy um, accordingly. Is that five a little too high? How did you guys arrive at the five on that? The five and the 15% tree canopy coverage ratio as a strategy. Was there some deeper analysis? No, this was a precedent that was set by the West End Small Area Plan that we carried over into this small area plan. Um, but if it's a little too ambitious, we could um, take it back a little bit 
Well, I would love to see more tree canopy coverage. So I'm wondering if it's ambitious enough. <laughs> so it, it was really my question um, on that end, if if we could um, just take a look at, at that tree canopy coverage compared to the acreage, just a thought there. And on the third one, so when we're talking about M1, that's mixed use that allows retail as well as multifamily residential, correct? Yes, I didn't that's, correct. Okay. that's correct, yes. Well, just, okay. just to clarify, M1 is the, the light industrial zone. Uh, MUR <laughs> is a holdover, it's the mixed use resident. So MUR is a mixed use residential overlay. M1 is the city's light industrial zoning district. Okay, where would you propose putting the M1 in so, this as a strategy? Sorry, so the suggestion isn't to, to convert anything to M1. Uh, so today okay. in the zoning ordinance, if you're zoned M1, you can walk into mixed use by using the MUR overlay. And uh -huh. what we're suggesting is that since it's been so difficult uh, to, for folks to access the actual MUR overlay, uh, to change that walkthrough allowance so that instead of walking through to MUR, you would allow landowners to walk through to the SE process, uh, which is what the city has, has historically used over the last 20 years for uh, redevelopment. Okay. That required a little bit of a translation because I read it differently until you actually explained that. I'm sorry. Uh, that, it, yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe is, that's uh, pretty. We can clean this. This is up. Jim Snyder. Um, the M districts, we have a lot of industrial zoning. We have it in the West End in the Gordon Road Triangle area. We have it along Four Mile Run in the Jefferson Street area, mm -hmm. and we have it out here. Uh, it is not a very f flexible zone, and it's something which I think is holding back better development. So changing the rules so it can be more flexible. We can allow um, uh, mixed use with the council's approval. We'll make it much more useful. Right now, it's really hard to do anything other than commercial or industrial. And it allows a lot of uses that you don't really want to encourage as a matter yeah. of right. And so it's uh, fixing this would also be very valuable to three other key areas of the city that have a sizable acreage of M1. Okay. Thanks, Jim. I'm I'm totally supportive of um, flexibility, right, and um, supporting mixed use. I just did not read it as such the way it's worded right now. So I, I just, um, if if you're gonna structure this for a little bit more layman's terms, <laughs> maybe I need the layman's version. <laughs> so just a consideration of making sure that folks don't get confused when they read that. On the fourth one, um, it. I'm a little confused. I support keeping that frontage on Roosevelt as T1. If I read this correctly, are you proposing to get rid of that T1 and converting all of 24-hour fitness to B1? Or am I just misreading that again? No, it's a little bit of... Um, Cindy, if you could go to... Let's see... You find it in the chapter. Um, it's going to be the third page. But I'm sorry, it's no, it's actually, we're looking at the zoning map. It's going to be the fifth page. Right, and the picture is it's, you're showing it as pink with dots, which is T1. But that strategy is indicating that you're proposing that you're changing that from T1 to B1, if I read right. it correctly. Right, so the, oops. If you go back to the zoning districts, yeah, so. That's current. Do you want the, no. the proposed picture? Um, no, I, I would like to go back oh, okay. to the existing okay. zoning. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this is our land use map, though. Yeah, so it should be page five. No worries. How's that? That's, That's good. good. Okay, okay yeah. so, so currently, currently, 
what we have um, is it's the lilac color. The lavender color is indicating the T1 transitional, and it's right across from that B3 area, which is where 24-hour fitness is. That's the spot that we want to bring into B1. So we would be going from T1 okay. transitional to, yeah, to complement across <clears throat> the street, the B3. Okay, so it's really maintain. So really, that strategy is currently uh, designated T one. We'll maintain as T one. It's the the that orange section that you you're looking to convert to B one. No, it's that it's the lilac across from the orange section that would be going to B one. So this that, would be uh, for for comparison's sake. This would be similar yeah, to the to the current application that's in for uh, Founders 2, where that frontage along Ellison today is zoned T1, and the application before council is to rezone it to B1, the, the re even though they're still only gonna build at a, I think a proposed 30 foot height along Ellison, the reason for the rezoning is because T1 does not allow for multifamily residential. And so the only uses allowed in T1 today are single family residential uh, or um, business uses. And so the recommendation here in the chapter is to allow for, as part of an application, a rezoning to B1 so that you could build a residential edge, uh, it, perhaps at a higher density, but a residential edge along that Roosevelt Street frontage. So I think where I'm trying to balance, right, is the fact that as I read the comments that were collected from the citizen engagement sessions that uh, a lot of residents are concerned around appropriate transition from residential to business, right? Uh, I know that we're, we have intention to discuss changing T1, right? And right now what you're doing is you're applying the existing definition of T1 since we haven't really taken on the conversation of how T1 can change. So I, I just want to make sure that, you know, we balance... <laughs> you know, the comment um, from the community around concern on that transition. Um, it, it, and I understand now where you're coming with this because you're trying to support, uh, you're working under the construct of what current T1 zoning does not allow, which is the residential piece. Okay. Understood. Yeah, that's correct. And there's actually on this same street, there's a positive example of this. Uh, if you travel down Roosevelt as it becomes South Street into Fairfax County, uh, what they did on the back of the Loren mm -hmm. building is actually something we might look to as an example, uh, the way they handled, obviously, the Loren on the Route 50 side is a mixed-use building with retail on the ground floor, taller uh, building heights. And then as it comes around on the South Street, it's a much lower profile, uh, almost a townhouse-style look. Okay. Okay, I appreciate it. Those are my questions um, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, I have various comments like Mary Beth. I read through a large part of this. And overall, um, I have not been around for all the small area plans, but I do think that this is one of the most well done ones I've seen. So really nice work on it. It's very thorough and comprehensive, and I look forward to the other chapters. Uh, so my comments are going to be a little all over the place because I tried to read everything. Um, agree with Mary Beth's comments about pop-ups, so not only just the Eden Center, but let's make sure we get to the residential buildings and perhaps actually the farmer's market is always a good place to catch people. Um, I think many people will actually be surprised to learn that this East End is actually part of the city of Falls Church. Um, a general theme and comment I have is, um, and I know that we noted um, one of the goals is really connections um, within the East End, but I want to make sure connections to the rest of the Falls Church and to Arlington and Fairfax County are considered as well, because when you look at the maps, this East End is pretty isolated out there. Not only do people not know that it's part of Falls Church, but getting there is certainly not walkable, whereas the other kind of 1.8 miles of the city um, is quite walkable that you can get from one end to the other. Right now, there's not a really great way to get there, especially if you have to traverse through seven corners. Um, and I know that we noted um, that in the plan is obviously interactions with the ring road. So between the timing of those investments by the county, how that might impact any of this will be a big question, um, especially the connectivity to the rest of the city. But that's kind of one big theme is make sure we connect to the rest of the city and the region, not just within the West End when we talk about multimodal. Um, the term redevelopment, I think, 
I've already shared feedback with both you and Paul, even when we had this meeting back in November, and I think we've done a nice job kind of clarifying the intent. Um, so I really like how I think in Node 2, you use words like preserve, kind of what's core and enhance, and then do things like infill, not replacement. So I think that is important to continue emphasizing because I think one of the reasons why we had such great community turnout is because people were very alarmed that we were bulldozing the Eden Center tomorrow, right? And so these really are kind of future plans of what we could envision there. So let's make sure we keep a check on using the word redevelop, especially if we don't really mean that um, in certain areas, because I do think that's important. Um, the culture part, I'm glad to see that um, very well emphasized. Um, like Mary Beth, um, I wonder whether we should think about not just the Vietnamese American community, but also a lot of the history. So the, one of the early chapters talks about kind of the um, uh, Frederick Foot um, history, the Native American history, which is very rich. Um, I'd love to actually see that reflected in the concepts and not just keep it as, oh, yes, we recognize this was part of the history, but how do we bring that forward? Um, something beyond Fort Taylor Park, which I think people know is kind of in that little pocket today at the corner there. Um, but how do we actually celebrate that history because it is so rich there? Um, not only the Vietnamese and Asian American history, but also the Native American and African American history. Um, so the culture part, um, I really liked uh, the instances of public art and then that gateway feature again because I think the east end is often forgotten as one of the ways that you can enter the city I think doing something really cool and unique and maybe perhaps linking with the culture stuff we talked about um, could be a good way to welcome people into the city while I'm on that thought um, I also noted the comment about renaming Wilson Boulevard to um, Saigon Boulevard I'm kind of neutral on that one um, but like anything, I probably would actually go to our constituents, right? So go to the business owners, go to the residents nearby and see what they think. We probably have opinions about it, but I actually care more about what they think. One thing that I think a lot of Chinatowns, for example, do well across the U.S. is actually use alternate um, other language on street signs. So even if we call it Wilson Boulevard, perhaps we can have that translated to Chinese and to Vietnamese and have that be something that, you know, shows up on our big green street signs in that area. So not a full step like renaming if that's not something that people will support, but maybe a nice hybrid step to, again, recognize the cultural influences in that area. Um, on the vision and goal section, um, I think the term language, the, the language was, I think, of community members. Um, because this is actually one of the more heavily visited parts of the city. And again, I think the Eden Center might be the biggest hub for Vietnamese American commerce on the East Coast. And so that's important to emphasize. I would love for us to actually change the language from community members to residents and visitors. Because when we talk about wanting Falls Church to be a destination, it already is a destination at the Eden Center. I don't think enough recognition goes there. So not just using the term kind of community members loosely, but um, being more specific and calling out that it's a place for both residents and visitors. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, another thing that I unfortunately did not write down the page number, but the specific language is used, I think, in that vision and goal section that says return the area to regional prom prominence. Um, I didn't really like that, frankly, um, because for me, I read that as there's an assumption that it's not very prominent today and that there's kind of a negative connotation. So I think that needs to be reworked um, because again, depending on whose perspective it is, the Eden Center is a terrific place for business already. I'm talking about Ring Road. Oh, uh, green space. So I also noted, I think it was Caroline who noted um, the 15% tree canopy. So as, as the newest liaison to urban forestry, um, I have now learned how to use the Tree Keeper software. So it's, it's actually a really cool tool that you can look up every single street tree in Falls Church. And so I played around with it last week and it is notably, the trees actually in the East End are notably absent. Like there's actually just a giant hole of trees. And obviously, as you noted, much of the land use right now is on surface parking lots and concretes. And so I want to make sure we hold a pretty high bar. So any redevelopment that happens, um, I would love to see 15%, if not more tree canopy and not have it anchored on a five acre minimum development. If we can do it at Weston Broad on a two acre site, I would love for us to get to 15% and more because it is um, unfortunate that there is so much concrete there. And so if we can add more green space, and again, uh, Jim Snyder often talks about how private dollars follows public dollars. So if we are ready to lead with some more public spaces and add greens, I think that will help. So I love that point. Um, and then lastly, um, my question is based on all of this work, I'm kind of curious whether there are any landowners that are curious or interested in any of these concepts right now. Um, I know that often small area plans are usually the first step to kind of signal what might be acceptable to the East End, but I'm kind of curious what um, let current landowners think about this plan. Is this aligned with what they want to do on their site? Um, so more of a question than a comment. 
Yeah, so, so we have so been in contact with um, stakeholders, i.e. landowners, in the very beginning. Um, mostly Eden Center, um, Alan Frank and his partner we talked with, um, uh, they're open to like facade enhancements and whatnot, but um, for the most part, they see it as if, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So mostly like small upgrades, um, but they've also floated, you know, the idea of, of liking um, the idea of senior housing or maybe a parking garage at Eden Center one day or a public plaza. Um, so mostly Eden Center stakeholders. Um, I don't think I'm forgetting anyone in regards to stakeholders, but we've also heard a lot from the community. Um, there's been a couple of people who have been emailing and um, are just keeping tabs on our process so far. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they're residents or business owners, but yes, there have been there's been quite a bit of engagement thus far. Okay, if possible, let's make sure that the other kind of commercial landowners are included besides the Eden Center. For example, like the Coon site is, you know, noted as future mixed use, right? And that's something that I'd probably be curious whether they have any interest in and how it aligns with what they plan to do with their land. Um, so let's make sure that this we is, broad that stakeholder list. This is Jim Snyder. Uh, the 24-hour fitness site was sold to a group from Florida who uh, recognized that the current lease is... Uh, is, is there and the business is there is fine, but longer term, they are interested in redevelopment and you know renovation of that site. Uh, when they purchased it, they asked about the future of the area. So again, I think this is something that could occur on that site when the appropriate time is there, but it was purchased by a group that bought it for its present use, but also looking ahead to the future as well. Um, I would mention also the uh, connectivity issue that you mentioned. Uh, the piece that uh, Emily pointed out, I mean, that is, those of you who have been walking through there, that is a giant gap, mostly features cars overhanging sidewalks that you can't pass by. It, it really is, uh, it really inhibits connectivity. And also the condition of Wilson Boulevard, money invested there in trees and lights and multimodal, which we hope could happen someday, uh, would really transform that street. Presently, it's really unremarkable except for its ugliness and its unfriendliness. And so that's one of the reasons I think on the plan, Paul, we have it identified as a future great street. Uh, you know, how our streets look, they look so much different in Falls Church than they do in other parts of our neighbors' properties. So I think those, those investments are things we'll need to do in the future and lobby for funds to get those done sometime in the future. Actually, one other comment that made me think of it, because you mentioned Wilson. Um, I believe this spring or summer, DPW might know better, that historic marker is going to go in at the Eden Center, recognizing kind of the Asian American history there. So I feel like that should be incorporated somewhere in our small area plan. I don't actually know where the site is, maybe why or something you might know. that it will be on the Eden Center private property adjacent to our right of way, but to keep it safe and not block a sidewalk. We haven't received a date yet, but I know it's been approved and the sign was going to go into production. So Emily, Zach would be a good follow-up contact for you. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's that's it. I was going to say, overall, really nice work. Thank you. Oh, oh, great. great. I'm just going to uh, try and build on Jim's point, point, just a little bit of a preview of what we've been talking about in the transportation chapter, the importance of those connections. connections. These streets really don't look like Falls Church streets. Uh, they look like county roads. Uh, and I don't mean Fairfax County, I just mean sort of a typical county design standard wherever you go in the U.S. Uh, and that's not really what Falls Church has as its image of its city streets, which are uh, street trees, benches, furniture, lights. Uh, crosswalks, uh, all, those all those things are missing, missing from this area. So, so, so a big thing, thing uh, as, as we're looking at transportation, transportation is how do you actually, actually get across these places? places. Uh, uh, streetscape standards in the city call for crosswalks every 250 feet. In some stretches, it's 800 or 900 or 1,000 feet between crosswalks, and, and those aren't particularly ones you'd like to use. Uh, the intersection of Roosevelt and Wilson only has crosswalks on two of the three legs. Uh, it's hard to find crossings in seven corners that actually do have crosswalks. Uh, if you happen to come to the point of the 24-hour fitness site, you got to go all the way back down to Roosevelt to find a safe crossing or a marked crossing. Uh, 
your point about regional connections, uh, obviously there's the East Falls Church Metro. There's also a 20 minute, uh, 12 minute bus service on the 28A, uh, other bus routes that run through the Fairfax County Transit Station, and then bike connections. Uh, you've got the WNOD just to the north, and then an ongoing uh, uh, regional effort to get a, um, a ped bike trail running along Route 50 all the way from City of Fairfax uh, into the D, uh, in, onto the DC border. So a lot of opportunities to connect into the regional transportation network, uh, as well as make it easier to, to get around this specific area. So all right. I'm excited about it. Sorry. That's I'll, okay. I'll Mary Beth Connolly. Thanks, Mary Charter. Just one more quick question. Emily, can you flip to the end to the zoning map that shows what the different zoning is? I noticed that the Oakwood property is zoned CD, Creative Design. Can you explain what that is? And is that anywhere else in the city? Um, if you could go to the zoning map in the slideshow. So, oh, that works too. The, yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. To be honest with you, I am not very familiar with the Creative Design District. It's something that I would have to read more into um, and follow up on. Um, that's why I highlighted the nearby residential. Um, I, I thought that was more significant to this project. Um, I'm not sure if Paul or Jim could elaborate on the CD district. Gary, uh, Creative Design is an older district. Uh, it's been... Uh, removed uh, from the zoning books, uh, but the, the properties with creative design designations were never rezoned. Uh, so we still apply the CD ordinance uh, to that property. The other one where it's in use uh, is over by the, um, the townhouses along uh, Hillwood Avenue. Uh, so there was an intent, as the name implies, creative design was to, to look for what other ways properties might develop beyond sort of what's typically done by right. Uh, but like I said, it's an older district. Uh, it's It's been knocked off the books, uh, but properties that had it back then still have it now. All right. Other we don't have any intent to change it at all? There's no need to change it or could it be changed no, this as part is, of this process? Well, this is outside the... Um, the, the, the residential towers uh, along Roosevelt are outside the POA. Uh, so generally when it comes to the small area planning, what we've tried to do as staff is think about how do we transition to those areas outside the POA and largely leave them as they are. All right, other questions or comments? So I've got a few. Um, Mr. Snyder, go ahead. Thank you. Um, a couple. Um, so the ring road um, from Fairfax County, the traffic movements that would be generated by that. Um, are we, A, assuming that in our planning and B, how we can use it to our benefit? Number one. Number two, the integration of the bus rapid transit system into this area so that it will be linked to uh, the rest of the city of Falls Church via the bus rapid transit. So my questions tonight, I don't want to repeat a lot of the other questions and comments, which were good from other council members, but I wanted to focus on transportation for a minute. Um, both the ring road, what we expect from it in terms of traffic generation or or removal of through traffic, which I think is intended to do, and then um, how we can best integrate the bus rapid transit into this um, area that we're hopefully going to be assisting in its positive redevelopment. Thank you. All right. So I've got a couple comments and questions. A, Eaton Center right now is a real economic powerhouse for the city. Um, I don't want to lose that. It doesn't sound like the owners do either. But I think we need to be careful about, you know, kind of replanning everything in a way that may um, eventually cause a very successful commercial area to be a, a dominated by a residential area. Um, and so I think we just want to keep the good that we have right now. I think the form in a lot of these places is dated, auto-centric, and absolutely needs to change. 
Um, but I think we also want to be really careful about losing like a real retail powerhouse and cultural icon here. Um, also, this is a little technical and maybe more for Carol um, across Cree, but there's going to be a major upzoning when people go from a 0.2 FAR to a 3 FAR. It's going to be a huge windfall. In Arlington, as you know, they might characterize that in, in a new uh, codification of the ordinance or an overlay to be bonus density so that the county or the city could then seek community benefits for the upzoning, such as affordable housing um, and uh, transportation improvements and other things that you might not otherwise be able to get, save for a zoning construct that recognizes it. So I would just put that out there to you, Carol, to be thinking about this, whether we want to come up with some kind of overlay that when people start coming in here, there's a way for the city to seek and receive substantial community benefits like affordable housing um, for the new um, higher densities that are going to be achieved. Carol, I don't know if you're on this call, but uh, I see your name, Jim. I think uh, this is the M district uh, could help us with that because anything that was done beyond what's there that had mixed use would need some type of special exception. And I think large sites like the Eden Center might require, you know, a special planning e effort if if that area was if there was intensive revitalization. We do have some large consolidated sites here, which is a plus. But I think uh, the M district's pretty narrowly useful now. And uh, the kinds of things you'd want to achieve, I think, could be done with amendments that would allow more flexibility. In other words, a, a, a tr a, an ability to walk into a, a mixed-use category where the kinds of things you're talking about could be required of a new project if it was achieving uh, more density and particularly residential. Yeah, yes. I, go ahead, Carol. I, I can certainly uh, work with staff on that. I've just started getting into this. Um, I hadn't been involved previously. So I will take a look at that and work with staff and see what we can, what kind of ideas we can come up with and implement. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for a very uh, well done presentation and plan. And we know there's uh, much more work to be done, but we appreciate all the outreach you've uh, done to date with the community. And it seems like a very exciting plan and proposal. So thank you very much. Look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. Sure. Um, why? Who's going to do the council retreat report? Is that you? Yes, uh, yes, Mayor. And um, so, uh, in the council packet is the write-up from the council retreat that occurred um, in uh, earlier in February. And Jack Tuttle wrote up that report, and I, I think it does accurately reflect the discussion. Um, in terms of tonight's discussion, I did want to just note and uh, for the for the full council what the intent is for next steps and turning this into a work plan. Um, and uh, but also wanted to hear from council in terms of uh, whether you think this accurately re reflects. Uh, the discussion and the priorities that uh, that you have in terms of what we want to accomplish over the coming two years. Um, so just at first in terms of process, um, since the, the retreat, staff has actually been very engrossed in 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 the budget work. And um, and and in terms of a change instrument, the budget obviously is an important uh, tool for affecting change in the city. Um, the CIP most dramatically so in terms of how we invest in our our infrastructure, our streets to make them more walkable, et cetera, all the things that you see in the capital improvements program. The budget development process is, you know, the majority of it is about sustaining existing programs and existing um, operations, but it also is the um, is is the way for the council also to set new direction in that. So we've tried to take the impulses that were sent um, from this council retreat and build those into the budgets that you'll receive on March 28th in terms of those recommendations and then take action on over the course of the, the coming weeks and uh, final action in May. Um, staff is intending to work in a more detailed way to develop um, ideas for implementing 
the sort of the priorities and the vision that the council has articulated through this retreat document and other uh, planning documents um, to come back with you with concrete ideas on things that we can we think we can accomplish over the coming two years get your feedback on that ultimate direction on that and then uh, before the end of June have that adopted and that can then be the touch point for kind of holding ourselves accountable for what we get accomplished over the next two years so that is the uh, the main idea um, in terms of going through this I could hit some of the highlights I've just in reading the report myself I tried to highlight all of the double digit uh, dot items in terms of the things that the council identified and we could go through those just to um, discuss those together but before I do that let me just pause in terms of any other this is really the council's document so I don't want to uh, dominate the discussion um, of it all right thank you Wyatt are there any um, comments uh, as to what Wyatt said so far all right why oh, yep we got one letty thanks why um yeah i read the document and i kind of went through a similar exercise where everything that was more than like 10 dots kind of rose to like a separate list so i had like a over 20 dot section and then what was like 14 to 17 dots and what was like 10 to 13 dots um, and it came up roughly around 20 20 things or so um, and so while there's lots and lots of really good ideas on there, um, I want to make sure that staff knows that I don't view that as the exhaustive and complete list, right? And so hopefully we can go through a deduping process with what's on the work plan, the current version of the work plan, um, and make sure that we didn't miss. Because I'm sure there's lots of really great ideas we came up with two years ago that probably still are priorities, but just didn't come up in the conversation. So I want to make sure that we at least acknowledge those, decide whether they're no longer important or whether we just forgot. Um, so I would just hate for us to forget things that, you know, we came up with two years ago because we couldn't get to because of COVID or resources or whatnot. So that's my main comment. Um, make sure we look at what's not there. Um, but overall, I thought it was um, notable that everything was very consistent with, I think, where this council has been the past, you know, four or five years. Um, the one new thing that I noted that actually got 27 dots, which might have been the top dot getter, if there's such a thing, was actually a process improvements to open new businesses. Um, so while economic development is, you know, largely obviously been a large focus of ours, uh, making sure that we think about um, efficiency and the processes that our citizens and our residents and business owners interact with, and making sure those run really well, um, should be, you know, something we've always been very proud of in the little city. But I saw that as kind of indication of something that should get renewed focus. Um, not just taking care of big developments, but also making sure that little processes like that work really well, too. All right. And I would just also add as to how many dots were here, or how many dots were there. There are certainly some of us present who didn't, you know, put all their dots and had trouble getting them off. And uh, for various reasons, I don't view that as an accurate representation of, um, you know, how much interest there was in a particular thing, how many dots there were. So at least that's my two cents as to, you know, the dot count. Uh, but anyway, why, why don't you proceed? Sure. Let me hit some of the highlights. And again, you know, we'll read the full report. And we also know that there's kind of a larger, uh, you know, policy framework that the council has been working on, and I, which I think there's a lot of continuity on. But what's very helpful about a retreat is that there is sometimes new ideas and new impulses that are sent. That um, that staff can then uh, you know think about and and come back to council with on on how we can do things differently. So some of the the top items that uh, did come out of this retreat and and you know, I'll just start with inclusiveness and social sustainability. Uh, there was a, a discussion of developing housing strategy for the middle range and to have a continuum of housing opportunities, and then that was followed with an uh, another one just about how to get to the missing middle on housing those were two um uh pretty uh you know things that got a lot of attention and discussion preserve what housing we have and add more affordable housing uh, was another uh, key point um in terms of inclusiveness and social sustainability there also was a point of putting um things on the table to help the council be more diverse. Um, and one of the things that was discussed was having salary, health care, or benefits uh, to make it more accessible for everybody in the community and also to continue electronic meetings also to the best extent um, possible under law 
also for board and commissions, um, that that could help with diversity and inclusiveness uh, in our governance structure. The um, under environmental sustainability, uh, some of the kind of major points of discussion was the sustained um, interest and effort in stormwater and urban flooding. Um, there was a note of kind of calling it, let's get serious on top three environmental priorities with dollars and staffing. And um, and so that that's kind of a, a prioritization charge also, because I think with the discussion of a lot of our boards and commissions, there's a lot of sort of effort in the environmental area. Um, and maybe we need to concentrate that effort to make um, concrete accomplishments in, uh, in specific areas in the uh, area of environmental sustainability. Um, a note that was uh, uh, got a number of dots was adding the second East Falls Church Metro entrance uh, to um, uh, promote transit and access to transit and reducing emissions. Um, I'll shift then to economic vitality. Uh, some of the, 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 as was just noted, the top vote getter of the entire process was process improvements for opening a business um, uh, and efficient permitting. And uh, one thing I will note, just as a preview to the budget, uh, using the permit fees that we are gathering right now, we will have a very strong program to uh, add additional resources to our uh, building safety functions, but also to the overall administration of the permit process. Uh, Paul and Jim and John Russell put together a very strong package. Um, I did trim that package just a little bit, but we'll let council be aware of the full package of the full proposal so you have that information. Um, and we thought we would probably phase it in, or at least that was the what we'll, you'll see in the recommendations that I bring. But I want you to see the full proposal as well. Um, there are a couple of points that I'm gonna kind of group together in the area of economic vitality uh, that gets to um, you know, the comment being intentional and tougher in negotiations, also promote commercial uh, diversity, uh, maybe less grocery stores and restaurants. And then the third point, which I think are all connected, connect what people want, what the market, uh, what people want to what the market will bear and which uh, uh, I think is a discussion we'd like to have with council about when we're sitting down with developers, what are the top things we want as a community in terms of the commercial uses? And we've done that work in the past and we've been very successful in the past in getting those commercial uses. We could refresh that list. Um, I think those are some of the, uh, the key points. I'll also note promoting infill development mechanisms to enable and create developer interest for infill development. Um, I'm going to shift to um, the discussion on city governance, and um, and one of the top vote getters there was having a constituent services or a problem solver uh, for sort of triaging um, uh, constituent issues and and um, having kind of a point of contact to help us get those resolved. Um, uh, that was kind of one one key point of the discussion. There's also a longer discussion about the number of sort of a city governance question about the number of meetings that we have. And um, and so I do want to work with council on that. And sort of one kind of concise idea is after the budget process to try over the summer months a process where we, we uh, have one work session and two regular meetings a month. I'll just put that out there for council discussion as a way to try to focus our efforts and our meeting times a bit more and see how that works over the summer months after the budget is complete. Um, on the area of uh, mobility and accessibility, uh, there's a, a, you know, obviously a lot of things there that got a lot of votes. So we'll just go through that list. Broad Street, accessibility standards for all street uh, ADA compliance, getting poles removed from sidewalks. That was, I think, the top um, priority listed in the uh, transportation area. Um, Microtransit, explore best practices to move people more efficiently, not just by car. Um, sidewalks and crosswalks, this is kind of the sustained effort on filling in the missing links 
and improving uh, safety uh, for all users of our streets, bikers, walkers, et cetera. Uh, managing traffic coming uh, from outside the city, uh, looking for a basket of solutions, including neighborhood traffic calming, which has uh, been a, a longstanding priority, uh, design and enforcement strategies, and education, uh, communication and an education. Uh, so we, you know, use the, uh, the uh, photo uh, enforcement is, is something that pops up in a couple of places uh, in, in this list. Uh, small town character, I think the second biggest uh, dot uh, gainer on the whole list was tree lighting for the city. And so we, we are working on that procurement process right now. And we look forward to uh, this summer uh, discussing options with the council to having a, a good tree lighting program uh, for the coming uh, fall and winter months. Uh, public art investments and special events financial support to community partners. Uh, so the example of being of watch night, could the city come to the table with grants, uh, with dollars to help our community groups um, in, their, in their work of uh, sponsoring special events throughout the city? Um, in the area of education, uh, the two big ones that uh, were, were uh, in terms of dots were uh, continuing with the revenue sharing, um, letting it possibly evolve um, into a, a more of a structure or just exploring the, the formality of that agreement. Right now, it is kind of a, an understanding that has served the city, I think, in the budget process very well for the past three to four years. Um, another one is city uh, citizen education on core key uh, city government issues, uh, such as budgeting, services that are provided, uh, some of the kind of the technical aspects of how budgeting is done in the city. The local composite index was, a, was an example. Uh, big economic trends, inflation. Uh, probably need to discuss that a little bit more about how that, what that means programmatically. Um, but uh, that, that was something that, that uh, was emphasized in terms of interest from council. And then uh, the last one that I will note before um, turning it back over to you in the area of health and public safety was a sustained commitment expressed to police staffing, uh, to social justice and reform, and to community policing and, uh, and visibility of our, of our um, uh, police officers. Um, working on parking and traffic and uh, mental health response and staff training, cr critical uh, incident response training and sustaining that. And then uh, the other one in the area of health and public safety that was noted is uh, enforcement and technology. Again, the photo cameras for speeding and school buses. So that's certainly not a comprehensive list. And again, I just sort of caveat this by saying we'll read the whole report and we know that, you know, working together, staff and council, uh, we will have a good work plan that I think um, hits the key priorities for city council. Knowing that that work plan is really the council's change agenda. And there's a lot of other things that happen in the city as as well, uh, but this is kind of the, the council's effort to steer the ship and uh, achieve our long-term, you know, the council's long-term vision for the city with more immediate actions over the coming two years. All right. Well, thank you very much, Wyatt, for that uh, comprehensive list. I know you said it wasn't comprehensive, but it seemed pretty comprehensive to me. Uh, let's go ahead and get council uh, comments. And uh, questions and requests, we'll start with Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, so I think that captures a lot of it. I kind of agree with Dave that, you know, let's not take the dots super precisely. I think generally you did hear that many of the top vote getters, whether it was in the 20s or the teens, were all important priorities. Um, one large kind of concept that we didn't have time to get to is really around reinvesting in our staff salaries. And so I want to make sure that the investments we made in mid-year are not one-time blips on the radar. And these are sustained things we can do because without actually having well-compensated staff that's competitive in the region, none of these priorities will get done. Um, and so that's certainly a commitment for me that I'd like to see done. I don't know whether it falls as a council work plan priority per se, but I do think that is an important kind of message to share with the rest of city staff is that um, investing in our staff and salaries and benefits um, so that we stay kind of competitive and not something that we have to do catch up on every few years is an important priority for me. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Leon. 
you got muted. You were muted. You're muted again. Now you're unmuted. Sorry. Um, it's mind of its own. I absolutely agree with Ms. Hardy. Um, I know that that uh, uh, um, a compensation only had um, a, a ranking of two, but I do think that um, it, it's very important to invest in our people, um, particularly, um, you know, I'm looking at budget and I'm looking at, um, you know, it's wonderful that we're compensating our teachers yeah, you know, when you add the cumulative um, increases to get them up to, you know, um, the COLA plus the step increase, uh, I can tell you that the, the increase on that is more than what the city staff are getting. So I just want to make sure that we are, you know, that there's parity there and we have a plan to treat city staff, you know, the way that they should be treated in terms of comp. All right, thank you, Ms. Hiscott. Um, just following on to those comments about staff compensation, as part of what we'll receive during your budget presentation, do we have the results from the compensation study? I know we won't have staffing study, but is that part of the next week's information, Wyatt? So what we will do for the budget is we'll provide a uh, recommendation on a on a on a base uh, compensation increase for employees and then we will uh, have built into the budget a contingency to implement the recommendations of the compensation study we hope to have the results of that study by um, uh, late april but it's going to be really close and um, and so that's just a uh, it's been the nature of the procurement process uh, we do have the, the contractor um, on board and we've given them all their all of our data um, but we don't have the results yet back. Okay, thanks for the update. Okay, are there any other comments or questions about the retreat uh, document? More to come. Why do you have a timetable on the more to come? Yeah, so uh, we will be working uh, on the work plan in, um, once the budget is, is done with council. So May timeframe, we'll be re-engaging on, on this with, uh, with the city council with the hopes of having the work plan adopted by the end of June. Okay, Ms. Connolly. Thanks, Mayor Charter. Um, why is it gonna end up being in the same format as the one from two years ago with the, the array, the grid, the matrix of information? So that we'll be so able to I, track how things go? I think it will look similar to that. I have been asking Jack Tuttle for some examples of work plans, and, uh, and he sent some other examples. So we're going to see if there aren't some ways we can fresh up the look um, as okay. well. That That's always been uh, kind of a homegrown effort that we've used. It's worked pretty well, but if there's better ways to do it, we, we want to explore that as well. And so yeah, if you all have any thoughts on that, that would be helpful. The Gantt chart is helpful because it does give us a sense of how things are proceeding through time over two years. So I think that is helpful. But yeah, I'd be interested in seeing a, a new look or a new way to organize that information. Thanks. All right. Unless there's any other comments on the retreat uh, document, I would suggest we go into closed session, take a break, let all the cameras come down or whatever needs to happen electronically and then reconvene, um, you know, in five-ish minutes back in closed session. And so I'm going to go ahead and read a motion going into closed session. The time is 9.05. Um, upon a motion made by council member... Yes, Scott. Yes, Scott. Seconded by council member... Hardy. <laughs> and passed by a vote of City Council, Council went in a closed session pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A8 for consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Legal advice regarding the agreement with Mill Creek for incentives on the Founders Row 1 site at 1001 and 1003 West Broad Street. Councilmember Connolly.
Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Leon? Yes. Biscott? Yes. Snyder? Snyder? Yes. Tartar? Yep. Okay, so let's go ahead. It's 9.06. Why don't we go into, uh, just go into recess till 9.15, and then reconvene a close session at 9.15.
are back in the main room and I have confirmation that FCC TV is live again for you. you just All right, right, thank, thank you. you. Can you give us a moment for the, the live stream, stream to go, go up, up too? too? One, One moment. moment. Always a long 45 seconds. <laughs> I, just I just don't, don't want to miss the motion. motion. Back in the main room, and I have confirmation. All right, upon right. right. good to go. Great, we're coming out of closed session. session. We're going to do a motion, motion to come out of closed session. session and a certification regarding the uh, contents of that closed meeting. Upon a motion made by Council Member Scott, seconded by Council Member Leon. And passed by a vote of City Council. Council reconvened in open session. Councilmember Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Leon? Yes. Iscott? Yes. Snyder? No. Dave? Oh, you're muted. Yes. Carter? Yep. All right, the time is 10.05. This is our certification upon a motion made by council member. Scott. I'm going to take his Scott. Seconded by council member. Leanne. All right, nice work. And passed upon affirmative roll call vote in open session. It was certified that only public business matters ex lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session meeting by the body. Councilmember Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Hardy? Yes. Leon? Yes. Biscott? Yes. Snyder? Yeah. Carter? Yep. All right. And is there anything else anybody wants to say before we adjourn for this evening? Wyatt, are we doing the Q2 financial update? So uh, we do have Ms. Bawa here, and uh, the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee did ask for the council to get a, a briefing on the seven-month financial report. And so maybe we could just uh, hit the highlights, Ms. Bawa, and share that information with the council. Sure. Good evening, Mayor Tarter and members of the council. So at the recommendation on last Friday at the Budget and Finance, uh, we have this current fiscal year 22 seven-month uh, revenue and expenditure report, and it was discussed in details uh, at the meeting on Friday. So key highlights um, include that uh, the overall revenues are up 2.1% um, or 1 million over the budget. Uh, target as of January 31st. And um, just to put it in perspective, net of uh, federal, state grants, and permit revenues and other interfund transfer, it translates to approximately 4% increase over last year for the primary revenue categories uh, for general fund. Um, revenues represent recovery of most uh, indicators uh, to pre-pandemic levels, um, to name a few sales tax, meals tax and charges for services, uh, primarily for rec and parks activity, have seen noticeable growth over last year. Sorry, there's an aeroplane going. Uh, hotel taxes at 65% um, of pre-pandemic levels. It was budgeted at 40%, so better than budget, but still that's one of the only categories that we have yet to hit the pre-pandemic level. Uh, on the expenditure side, um, we are um, it shows an underspending of approximately 642000 at this point. But I do want to mention that um, due to cyclical nature of contracts and some uh, service agreements, um, the third and the fourth quarter uh, will see some uh, drawdowns on those accounts. And um, there is active recruit recruitment of some key vacancies. So we'll have a better picture on that uh, in the next quarterly report. Um, and uh, finally, I want to mention that the city manager's budget proposal that is to be presented um, next Monday on the 28th, which will include um, these projections um, based, I mean, the overall projections for next year are going to be based on these results along with what we're seeing in uh, February as well. So 
I'll stop there. And uh, I do want to mention the the report was emailed to council. Pages three and four have um, listing of each revenue and expenditure um, category by um, in detail. So happy to address if there are any questions. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, Mr. Duncan? Thank you, uh, Mary Beth. Did you want to say something? I didn't want to cut you off. I just want to say thanks to Kieran for bringing that up. And when we went through it at the Budget and Finance Committee, um, I really appreciated that the first page and a half was a narrative. So if you're a person who understands things by reading narrative, that makes a lot of sense. And the next two pages were spreadsheets. So if you're a spreadsheet person, that one makes a lot of sense. So um, the combination of the two is very helpful. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks for hosting the Budget Committee meeting. I enjoyed listening to it. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, that I didn't bring up during the meeting because you all were tight on time. One, at the previous meeting, you had the very helpful uh, chart of the city's various reserve funds and how much is in them. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that that, that uh, chart is, uh, and I think Letty had a couple of questions, maybe additions to it. I just want to make sure that that chart is part of the budget materials that we'll see and also where the dollar figures land us in terms of our policies on how much should be in these various reserve funds or and or what the plan of expending them is if there is one it's just helpful i think to see that uh, uh, that amount of money which is a substantial amount of money you know we're keeping close track of it and we all can explain to the average person where the money is going or is at least parked until it goes where it's supposed to be directed. Uh, and the only other thought is my editorial comment, which is uh, <laughs> the, the fact that we're running ahead on revenues and under on spending is, well, the fact we're running ahead on revenues is always good. Underspending is, you know, a mixed bag because it means that we're, you know, not yet maybe hiring positions that we're really trying hard to hire, but it's good that we're trying. Uh, but it, it does lead, I'm afraid, to some sense that, wow, you know, the bank's back open, uh, which maybe to some degree it is. I don't know. I'm just one person. But uh, those of you who have gotten your assessments, uh, I got mine today. My house is up 20 percent. And I think that <laughs> you're going to get in the next few days as those assessments begin to hit in, you know, a real shockwave. Uh, across the city among some folks not everybody's is going to be up 20 percent, obviously but some are and all are up and i just you know would like that to be in the mix of everybody's thinking in addition to the opportunities that might present themselves because we have more revenue than maybe we thought we were going to have i don't know six weeks ago or certainly in december when we gave budget guidance thank you all right. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly more to come on this issue. Um, and I know there's going to be lots of public discussion about it as well. Is there anything anybody wants to say, Mary Beth, Dave, Letty? Uh, Dave could go because I already talked. I'll go after him. I'd uh, defer to Letty. Letty can go and then I'll... no problem. Letty? Oh, I'm happy to go. Um, on that note, so I did really like that chart. So thank you, Mary Beth, for initiating out of budget and finance. I think the general conversation I remember from February is that after the land payments come in, we really should revisit the reserve picture um, because right now I think total reserves is at 30% total fund balance, if I remember correctly, Karen, and I think policy yes. says 20%, right? And so I know we were trying to be conservative because we were holding up for those land payments. Why, unless I'm hearing otherwise, that is on track by the end of April which should sync up well to our budget timelines. And so I'd request that we just make sure we look at that as part of the budget process, because that is kind of one-time money, but it is a big amount of one-time money that we should think about. Um, so hopefully that is part of the FY23 budget discussions. All right, who's next in all the deferral here? Um, who goes next? Caroline, you go next. You're the, <laughs> everyone else is uh, <laughs> sure. go. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Phil, thanks for raising that. And I do think um, from a budget and uh, finance committee perspective, um, you know, Mayor Beth, it's good to talk about, um, you know, as room to grow on not only the revenue share and how we want to do 2.0 of that after four years of doing a 1.0 version, but making sure that, you know, we're, we're consistent um, in terms of policy for reserves. 
um, when I asked the question in the budget committee meeting, you know, to um, schools, whether they had a policy, the answer was, um, it's a good question, Caroline, we do not. Um, we operate off of a threshold based on um, the equivalent to GAB for um, governments, which is, uh, I believe it's uh, the GASB, and he cited a threshold of about 5%. So I think, um, you know, th there's uh, schools considers themselves, a, you know, part of the city and city employee, we're one family. I think when we take a look at consistency, you know, around policy for reserves, you know, there's no reason why they should be an outlier from, you know, the, the you know, the, the thresholds that Karen is using for reserves. So I do think that's an opportunity for future agendas for Budget and Finance Committee. All right, so Mary Beth or Dave, this is a really big uh, issue. Who's going to go next? <laughs> you go, Dave, then I'll go. Okay, Mary Beth, thank you. No, 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 no. Uh, a, a, a couple other factors here worth considering. We're still carrying the largest debt we've ever carried in the history of the city. And while I appreciate we've made some payments, <clears throat> we still have to have enough money aside to carry us over a number of years if um, if there are some defaults uh, on the West End. Um, the second point is we have a lot of unknowns in Richmond, and frankly, some of the knowns are becoming less pleasant with each day. And keep in mind that um, it's not just direct hits to the city for things like uh, eliminating the grocery tax, but things like... Um, freezing or eliminating the motor fuels tax will have an impact on our transportation obligations for metro and other things. So I, I guess I'm going to be a little less optimistic here, having lived through the financial crisis when we had a number of great years and then they came to a screeching halt. Um, and then we weren't carrying the kind of debt we are now. So I would, I would add a note of caution and also of uh, concern um, uh, about meeting our, our needs, entirely appropriate, um, but also maintaining some competitiveness with our tax burden with similar uh, jurisdictions of our size. So those are all factors which I will be looking at um, in, the, um, in the budget as we, um, as we continue to look at it. Thank you. Mary Beth. All right, my turn. Thanks. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. After the uh, Budget and Finance Committee meeting in February, when we talked about those charts, Carolyn and I met and had a couple suggestions to clarify some of those things, which I shared with Karen, and she said she would clarify some of those charts. So by the time we see them, they'll have a little more information on them. That's the first thing. The second one is, and I think it's really important for all of us to remember, building a budget is very akin to making a jigsaw puzzle where there are a lot of pieces that are there and there are a lot of pieces that aren't there. And I don't want to make any promises, any commitments until we know what those pieces, where those pieces are and we can put them in to the right spots. Because as Dave Snyder said, I mean, we have the hugest CIP program we ever have. We have inflation. We have all sorts of things that we just don't know the answer to yet. So I, I just feel like we're jumping ahead to already be talking about what we're going to do in April when we don't even have enough of those pieces in place and a crystal ball there. So um, I really want to thank Karen for bringing this, showing this to us tonight so we can digest it before we get to the uh, budget presentation next week. And Wyatt forwarded to all of us something else that came out of the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. The schools put together a description of their budget in bite-sized pieces with the re and my request to all of you is that before we get to next Monday, if everyone watched those videos, review that material so that you're well prepared for what the school board budget has in it. Um, so that when we actually get to the meetings, we won't have to spend a lot of time retreading material that's already been tread and that is in front of us. And then we can ask the appropriate questions when we're all there together. So that I think will save us a lot of time and energy as we go forward if we're not repeating questions that have already been asked and answered. Um, but thank you for this, and um, I'm really looking forward to next week as we begin to assemble our budget jigsaw puzzle. All right, Debbie. I think Mary Beth said the bottom line of what I'm, you know, I'm looking for. I don't feel I have all the pieces to be making those decisions, and all these components are incredibly important. Um, you know, assessments, inflation, um, knowing what our state revenue is, knowing how the grants are going to be impacted for our CIP. Um, and obviously paying for the high school. That was a big reason that I 
have been interested in being at city council in the first place because in 2017 it worked really hard in the bond referendum to make sure that we could build that high school and we when voters voted on that bond referendum it was advertised that our tax rate could go up as high as seven cents to afford that high school and that was communicated in everything that we put out and um you know those who are proponents of the the bond and our voters voted for that so we just you know, sometimes I feel like I need to remind people that there was an agreement back in the day that to afford this, we had agreed to, and we've, a, we've actually gone the other direction. Thanks to a lot of the economic development, thanks to a lot of the great work of people on this call and, and city staff. Um, so I just want to throw that piece also into the mix of the jigsaw puzzle that, um, you know, that was part of a conversation when we made that decision to undertake such a huge, uh, a huge project back in the day. And that was what our constituents and our voters at that time agreed to do. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully it was a pretty good job of communicating that at the time. So this is, um, it's just important to keep in mind that as well. Just another one of those pieces in the thousand or 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle that we're putting together to do its best to make sure our services are taken care of, the roads are paved, our, you know, our streets are safe, sidewalks are there, our staff's paid well, uh, and that our residents can receive tax relief when we have the opportunity to do that. I think it's important to keep all those things in mind. That's all. All right, thank you. Well, Karen, thank you for sticking around and giving us that update. Nice work. Plenty more to come on that front, I'm sure, and you'll be busy, as mm -hmm. I think we all will, over the next uh, month or two. But unless there's any further comment or question, um, I would suggest we adjourn for the night, and we'll be seeing each other in another 36 hours or so. So uh, anyway, um, you all have the, a great evening, the rest of the evening, and thanks for a productive meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Right. Thank you. We're Good night. Good night.